Welcome to the Edwin Meese III Originalism Lecture. Please welcome John Malcolm, Vice President of the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Constitutional Government. So I am delighted to see you all here today, and those of you uh, who are joining us online uh, for a really special uh, occasion, which is the, uh, the first uh, Edwin Meese originalism uh, lecture. Uh, and I'm thrilled that it's being delivered by my, my good friend, Professor Josh Blackman. Uh, Josh is an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law uh, in Houston. He specializes in constitutional law, uh, U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and the intersection of law and technology. After graduating from the George Mason Law School, now, of course, the Scalia Law School, uh, he clerked for Judge Kim Gibson on the Western District of Pennsylvania and Judge Danny Boggs on the Sixth Circuit. In addition to being a regular contributor to the Volokh Conspiracy, which is I'm sure how many of you know him, he is an adjunct scholar uh, at the Cato uh, Institute. He is the founder and president of the Harlan uh, Institute. He's also the author of three books. Uh, I am also delighted to announce that Josh is going to be the chief editor of the next edition of the Heritage Guide to the Constitution. And we are really thrilled and privileged uh, to have him here today as the first Edwin Meese Originalism Award recipient. Josh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello. Uh, it's, an, it's an honor. It's my honor to deliver the inaugural Edwin Meese Originalism Award. We're honored here especially because we have Attorney General Ed Meese in the room. Uh, it's <laughs> you can stand. It's, it's sort of like having an audience with a pope to sit with them. I feel kind of... Uh, and I'm Jewish, what do I know? But it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of special to just have him in your presence. Uh, a lot of your young law students maybe don't quite know, but I hope today to give you some history to explain why this lecture is so significant. Let's go back in time to 1985. President Reagan was sworn in for a second term. Attorney General Meese was sworn in as a 75th Attorney General. Chief Justice Berger would begin his final term on the Supreme Court. And in 1985, I turned one year old. <laughs> Thanks, Mom and Dad. Uh, uh, over the span of one year, from 1985 to 1986, there would be a revolution in the law. Justice Rehnquist became Chief Justice Rehnquist. Judge Antonin Scalia became Justice Antonin Scalia. The Justice Department was staffed with Federal Society attorneys. And Attorney General Meese gave three foundational speeches. First, in 1985, General Meese spoke to the American Bar Association. He announced emphatically that the Reagan administration would press for, quote, a jurisprudence of original intention. The DOJ would, quote, endeavor to resurrect the original meaning of constitutional provisions and statutes as the only reliable guide for judgment. Mises' remarks sent shockwaves through the legal profession, and it struck a nerve at the Supreme Court. Three months later, Justice William Brennan, the liberal lion, felt compelled to respond. In a speech at Georgetown, Brennan charged that originalism was, quote, little more than arrogance cloaked as humility. Brennan endorsed living constitutionalism and rejected originalism. He wrote, quote, the genius of the Constitution rests not in any static meaning it might have had in a world that is dead and gone, but in the adaptability of its great principles to cope with current problems and current needs. Debate wasn't over yet. The following month 
in November of 85, Attorney General Meese gave the second foundational speech to the DC chapter of the Federal Society. And he responded forcefully to Brennan. Meese said, originalism is not difficult to describe. Three things. First, where the language of the Constitution is specific, it must be obeyed. Second, where, the, where there is a demonstrable consensus among the framers, it should be followed. And third, where there's ambiguity, it should be interpreted and applied in a manner so as at least not to contradict the text of the Constitution itself. Finally, Mies laid out the terms of this great debate between the originalists and the living constitutionalists. He said, quote, we are distinguished opponents and living, I'm sorry, we are distinguished opponents and we carry on the old tradition of free, uninhibited, and vigorous debate. Meese explained, out of such arguments come no losers, only truth. It's the American way. It is. And the founders would not want it any other way. One year later, in October of 1986, Meese would give the third foundational speech. The speech came at Tulane University in New Orleans. Fun fact, Meese was hosted by a young law student named William Pryor. You may know him. He is the chief judge of the 11th Circuit. Um, at the time, uh, Meese made a very simple but foundational point. He wrote, there is a necessary distinction between the Constitution, capital C, and constitutional law, lowercase c. The two are not synonymous. Meese articulated the theory known as departmentalism. He wrote, the Supreme Court is not the only interpreter of the Constitution. Rather, each of the three coordinate branches of government created by the Constitution have a duty to interpret the Constitution, not just the courts, the executive and legislative branches. Here, Meese channeled departmentalism. It wasn't new. Meese used the same language that Abraham Lincoln used a century earlier to challenge the Dred Scott decision. Yet, Meese still created a firestorm in the profession. These three speeches to the ABA in July of 85, to the Federal Society in November of 85, and to Tulane in 1986 began a great debate. Three decades later, I think we can pronounce a winner and a loser in this debate. Justice Brennan and living constitutionalism, they lost. <laughs> General Meese, Justice Scalia, and originalism were victorious. If you want proof of this victory, look no further than across the street at the Supreme Court confirmation hearings that concluded today. Judge Katanji Brown Jackson was asked how she interprets the Constitution. She said, I'm going to read you the quote. I didn't make this up, I swear. She said, I'm looking at original documents. I am focusing on the original public meaning because I am constrained to interpret the text. Amazing. She was asked, is there a living constitution? Quote, I do not believe there is such a thing as a living constitution. These answers would have been unthinkable three decades ago. She's saying Brennan was wrong. She's admitting it. She is directly contradicting what was gospel for three decades or longer. It's a Democratic nominee to the Supreme Court feels compelled to identify original public meaning as part of her methodology. And look, she's not alone. Justice Amy Coney Barrett, originalist, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, originalist. Justice Neil Gorsuch, originalist. Even Elena Kagan said, we're all originalists now. By my count, with Justice Breyer's retirement, only two members of the court rejected originalism. Justice Sotomayor and, well, Chief Justice Roberts. <laughs> Seven out of nine ain't bad. 
Still, for this amazing transformation of the law, we must give credit to the namesake of this lecture, Attorney General Meese. Thank you. Thank you. My, my sincere hope is that every year this, le this lecture excuse me, will, will promote the cause of constitutional originalism and bring honor to the general's legacy. Thank you. I'm not done. I'm not done. And for reasons I don't understand, I'm up first, so you're stuck with me for the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, now on to my prepared remarks, which you were told we'll be talking about, which is originalism and stare decisis in the lower courts. Uh, the tension between originalism and stare decisis is well known. Many of the Supreme Court's most significant decisions are completely unmoored from the original public meaning of the Constitution. A Supreme Court justice, let's say Clarence Thomas, may recognize that a given precedent is non-originalist, right? And may decide to deviate from the decision. Or a justice can say, I will follow the decision because of stare decisis. The Supreme Court's unique. They have that choice. They're perched atop the judiciary, and they have leeway to either follow the stare decisis or say we reject it. Lower court judges, like a couple people in this room, do not have that sort of discretion. A judge in a federal court of appeals is bound by the Supreme Court precedent interpreting the Constitution, regardless of whether those decisions are originalist or not. They're called inferior for a reason. No matter how wrong a given Supreme Court case is from an originalist perspective, the precedent must be adhered to. Moreover, a circuit court judge is bound by circuit precedent regardless whether that precedent's originalist or not. Generally, only an en banc court of the Court of Appeals can reverse a circuit precedent, but those are quite rare. An originalist circuit court judge has free reign only in rare cases of first impression, where neither the Supreme Court nor the circuit court has considered the constitutional question. Even then, she's at a comparative disadvantage. Circuit courts seldom receive the wealth of originalist briefing that are directed to the US Supreme Court. Here, the circuit judge will often do all the work on his own, the law office history report, as they call it, without the benefit of the adversarial process. In short, it's tough for a lower court judge to be a constitutional originalist. But it can be done. And that's the topic of my remarks this evening. Uh, the first part of my remarks will explain when a lower court judge can be an originalist. The second part of my remarks will explain how a lower court judge can be an originalist. Let's start at the when. Um, originalism operates difficulty, uh, sorry, differently on the Supreme Court and on the lower courts. The justices are constrained, but not bound by stare decisis, and can reverse a non-originalist precedent. Circuit court judges are bound by Supreme Court precedent, no matter how flawed those cases are. Lower court judges will generally have free reign only in the rare case of first impression, where there's no Supreme Court or circuit precedent on point. But to be frank, in most cases, that's not the case. But still, lower court judges have discretion. And I look for guidance in a recent case called Garza versus Idaho. Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch articulated one framework. They explained, quote, if there is little available evidence suggesting that certain precedents are correct as an originalist matter, the court should tread carefully before extending our precedents in this area. Um, lower court judges can't be quite so bold as Justice Thomas can, but I think they can use this framework to promote the cause of originalism. Okay. Um, the issue with Garza is how do you know whether to extend or not extend a given precedent, right? And I think Justice Thomas and Gorsuch give you some guidance. Garza versus Idaho considered whether an attorney provided ineffective assistance of counsel. The case turned on a court decision, a Sixth Amendment case called Strickland against Washington. If you guys are be law clerks, you'll know about Strickland. Garza, Garza split seven to two. The majority court held that 
uh, various precedents of the court uh, uh, should rule for the defendant. Justice Thomas and Gorsuch disagreed. As a threshold matter, they argued that the majority opinion had no basis in precedent. Therefore, there was no reason to depart from Strickland. But they didn't stop with precedent. They also contended that the majority opinion has no basis in the original meaning of the Sixth Amendment. Part three of the dissent, which you should all read later, charted a roadmap for lower court judges. Justice Thomas observed that the majority opinion breaks from the court's precedent and moves the court another step further from the original meaning of the Sixth Amendment. He reiterated a point Justice Scalia made in a case called Padilla versus Kentucky. Scalia wrote the Sixth Amendment as originally understood and ratified meant only that a defendant has a right to employ counsel or use volunteered service of counsel. Scalia said the Sixth Amendment did not guarantee a right to have effective counsel. Strickland v. Washington, Thomas wrote, was decided without even discussing the original meaning of, this, of the Sixth Amendment. Second, Thomas reasoned that because of these non-originalist precedents, convicted criminals can relitigate their claims on appeal, couched as ineffective claims. Thomas's third point was most significant. He concluded that because little available evidence suggests that this reading is correct as an original matter, becomes the important part. The court should tread carefully before extending our precedents in this area, extending. Rather, he sought to cabin the court's ineffective assistance precedents to the context in which they arose. Thomas did not ask the court to overrule Strickland. Probably would want to, but he didn't ask for that in this case. Uh, Thomas wants to overrule a lot of cases, you know, New York Times against Sullivan, among others. Instead, Thomas said we should use Garza to limit the reach of these non-originalist precedents. And I'll use a familiar hypothetical from torts, which you all, or at least most of you, probably studied. Uh, imagine there's a row of three houses, townhouses, kind of like the Freedom Center on the Heritage Block, right? Uh, bad example. The first house is on fire. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think that went through. The first, uh, so I ad lib, I'm in trouble. The first one was on fire. And in the law, to prevent the third house from burning down, you can demolish the second house. Just as Thomas's approach operates in a similar fashion, he confines the fire and prevents further collateral damage. Limit the bad precedent to that case and do not extend it further. Thomas wrote, even if we adhere to this line of precedence, our dubious authority in this area should give us pause before we extend these precedents further. In other words, this far but no farther. So how can lower court judges extend precedent or decline to extend precedent. I think it can be done with certain tweaks. And here's how I phrase it. If a Supreme Court precedent is unequivocally wrong as an original matter, a lower court should tread carefully before extending that precedent to a novel context. I think this operation has three steps. Um, first, a circuit judge should determine whether a given Supreme Court precedent is completely unmoored from the original understanding of the Constitution. This standard should be deferential. A mixed Supreme Court decision that relies on originalism and non-originalism would not suffice. For example, a case called McKee versus Cosby. Justice Thomas described New York Times versus Sullivan, yeah, and that's why Bill Cosby, by the way, it's Bill Cosby. Uh, Justice Thomas dis, uh, described New York Times versus Sullivan as policy-driven decisions masquerading as constitutional law. He's right. Uh, to be sure, the actual malice standard from Sullivan was just made up out of a whole cloth. But the constitutional objection to the Sedition Act of 1798 provides some originalist basis to impose a higher bar of liability for government officials. Right? So there's some basis. Moreover, many landmark decisions rely on originalism as the law, whether they admit it or not. Will Bode and Steve Sachs make this point quite well. So I think a circuit justice should, not, should only apply Garza if she can demonstrate demonstrate in a written opinion that a given constitutional rule was fabricated of whole cloth, entirely of whole cloth. It's a hard standard to satisfy, but I think it can be done. OK, step two. A circuit judge must decide if the instant case requires an extension of non-originalist precedent. Again, this standard should be deferential. 
In almost all litigation, the plaintiff will argue that a position squarely supported by long-standing precedent. The defendant will counter, no, 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 this is a radical departure, don't rule in favor of the plaintiff. If the plaintiff is correct, the court should follow the non-original precedent. If the judge decides that's unclear, follow the precedent. But if you have a case that is such a clear deviation from precedent, then don't extend it. The judge should decline to extend the precedent by its own force to the plaintiff's novel claim. Constrain the fire, knock down the townhouse, not the Freedom Center. A Supreme Court precedent with no basis in the Constitution has only one value. It's a Supreme Court precedent, no more, no less. And that precedent should be given all of its due weight, but nothing more. OK, there's a third step. This one's the important one. After the non-original's precedent has been cabined, the circuit judge should consider the question presented from original's perspective. Is the plaintiff's novel claim based on a persuasive originalist case, divorced from precedent? Or does the original understanding of the Constitution foreclose the plaintiff's claim? The original circuit judge would then decide which side is stronger. The original circuit judge would decide as a matter of first principles, not encumbered by non-original's precedent. And going back to General Mises' speech 35 years ago, where the original meaning of the Constitution does not support the novel claim, the court should defer to the state and the government to make their policy determinations. Now, some people may object to this methodology. Litigants may lose to a constitutional remedy if the lower courts adhere to the original meaning of the Constitution. But that purported unfairness is premised on an important assumption. Judges have some general power to develop constitutional law to promote fairness. Some scholars and judges may support this sort of common law framework. I don't. <laughs> In some cases, the law as written does promote fairness. And in other cases, to quote Dickens, the law is an ass. It's true. Some of the law is just unfair, even the Constitution. When possible, originalist judges should restore the correct, albeit unpopular, understanding of the Constitution. And they can do so by following Garza's three-step framework. OK, that's part one of my talk. Now the second part. How can a lower court judge be an originalist? In an ideal world, where all of you are lawyers soon enough, all advocates would develop original arguments in all constitutional cases. Even progressives, KBJ perhaps, who are generally skeptical of originalism, would fine tune their briefs to persuade originals to cross the jurisprudential divide. Even now, progressives are writing so-called Gorsuch briefs. <laughs> you know them. In Bostock and other cases, try to persuade one of the court's uh, most conservative members. That strategy makes sense at the Supreme Court when only five or six votes in play. But given the current status quo, advocates in the lower court are less likely to invest the time and resources to generate meaningful originalist arguments. More often than not, the effort is not worth the candle. At the Supreme Court, all high-profile cases get a load of amicus briefs. In the lower courts, originalist friends are few and far between. But lower court judges have some power. They can remedy this deficiency. They can request supplemental briefing to determine whether a given Supreme Court precedent is supported by original's meaning. This can be done on an ad hoc basis or even through a standing order. Either way, judges can ensure that originalism is tested through the adversarial process. And through this process, judges can ensure their opinions are of the highest quality. So let me talk a bit for a minute about the current lack of original's briefing in the lower courts. Um, we'll be honest, you guys can be law clerks in a few months. Briefing's not always the best. So in some cases, law school mood court briefs are better than those you'll see in the federal courts. Am I right? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, as a result, judges, or at least originalist judges, have to do their own homework sometimes. And this raises ground to the criticism of the law office history, which is a common charge against conservative justices. And again, it's commendable but problematic. Um, often, the rigor of the research varies. Right? Most attorneys, from judges to law clerks, don't have the kind of training needed to develop original research. And I don't mean this to criticize judges. Right? Only a tiny percentage of their docket implicates original meaning. They don't have the time to go through this. Also, there's a general failure of legal education. It's true. I'm a professor. I can, I can speak to this. 
Most law students are exposed to originalism, if at all, briefly during 1L in common law. Law schools, outside of a few other places, do not offer upper level classes on originalism. This is a mistake, but I hope it's going to change. I hope you all consider programs at Georgetown, such as Randy Barnett's Constitutional Law Seminar and others. These programs will give you intensive training and help judges encourage their clerks to apply there. Uh, there's another problem when sort of law clerks and judges go to loan. Uh, there are errors. Um, if you have more judges who can sort of check your work, that helps. But still, we do not want mistakes. The only thing bad than originalism is bad originalism. Uh, it's, 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 it's very problematic. And third, when judges do their own homework, it's not vetted through the adversarial process, right? Lawyers may receive an adverse judgment based on flawed historical analysis. Um, and this is not limited. This problem's not limited to originalism, but we should be more careful. So the better answer is promote what I call adversarial originalism. Have the parties brief it, OK? This can be done on an ad hoc basis. So let's consider a hypothetical case. Right, the plaintiff asks the court to recognize some new Sixth Amendment violation. The panel can ask the parties to brief how that extension of precedent is justified by original understanding of the Sixth Amendment. It's a simple order. The courts often ask for supplemental briefing on really unusual questions. They can do that. And you can make this appeal at the outset when the scheduling order is issued. That way, the parties aren't given the burden of writing two sets of briefs, which I think is actually problematic. Okay. Um, Judges and law clerks can actually screen cases when you get the initial assignments, read what the case is about, and decide briefings warranted. Um, these orderly processes ensure that there's adequate time to address these issues. And counsel can answer those questions at oral argument. Right? This is helpful because there's responses. The plaintiff can respond to the defendant, and the defendant can respond to the plaintiff. Right? So you actually have adversity in the original process. Uh, it's also possible the court may decide to appoint an amicus to participate in the proceedings. It could be a scholar who has expertise in this area or even a private party. This is especially important if the, if the parties are just deficient and they don't do the job the court wants. An amicus may be warranted. Another approach, which could be suitable perhaps in the 5th or 6th or 11th circuit, maybe, or the 8th, uh, would be a standing order. Um, serious. A standing order, a court rule, that says, if you are doing a constitutional case, brief originalism, right? And I have a sample text that could say, in any case that implicates an extension of constitutional precedent, all parties shall brief and explain how the original public meaning of the Constitution supports or forecloses that extension. And you can invite amicus to file a leave as a matter of right on this issue. Very simple order that could really shift how the courts work. I think we have a critical mass of original judges who can actually pull this off. When you guys are all chief judges in a couple of years, it works. This umbrella approach ensures that all judges are provided with comprehensive and balanced historical analysis that are vetted by the adversarial process. Okay? There are no surprises. And advocates on both sides can have their arguments duly considered. Moreover, amici will have an express incentive to participate in a case knowing that a court will be receptive to their arguments. Once this briefing record is developed, judges should be far more comfortable to engage in original jurisprudence to determine whether a given Supreme Court precedent is supported by original meaning and whether that precedent can be extended. Now, dissenting colleagues who may be otherwise not inclined to find originals and persuasive, will need to develop originals responses to the majority. Look no further than Judge Jackson, who's speaking in our language about originalism. Look no further than D.C. v. Heller, an originalist case in the Second Amendment. Justice Stevenson say, as a matter of living constitutionalism, you know, the Second Amendment's outmoded, let's go on. He tried to write a thoroughly originalist dissent in response to Justice Scalia's majority opinion. Moreover, when you have an appellate record on originalism, it provides clarity for Supreme Court review. If a lower court judge makes a compelling originalist argument that the Supreme Court's own precedent cannot be supported by original meaning, that has an upward effect. Reagan's popular here. This trickle down 
It's also a trickle up. It is entirely feasible that this process actually convinces the judges that you can't resolve an issue, right? This research may not actually be helpful. Maybe after all the originalist research, you realize, you know what? Originalism doesn't give you an answer here. It happens. But this framework leaves open the possibility that originalism can be used to decide important questions. Now, my theme here is how lower court judges can expand their own use of constitutional originalism. But this approach need not be so limited. Judges who adopt this framework will invariably exert market pressure, so to speak, on the bench and the bar to become more familiar with originalism. Law firms who want to persuade originalist judges will rationally incorporate originalist arguments into their briefs whether voluntarily or response to court order. <laughs> Public defenders, in particular, be well served to think in terms of originalism. Conservative jurists may be personally opposed to the plight of the accused, but favor the rights of the accused, as originally understood. But this sort of briefing cannot be cobbled together haphazardly. Practicing attorneys of all stripes will need to improve their ability to develop originalist arguments. In an ideal world, law firms will begin to recruit associates who have originalist bona fides. Imagine that. You don't have to hide it on your resume. You can actually brag about it, <laughs> right? And dare, dare I dream, law schools, law schools may recognize these market forces. Not never going to happen, right? <laughs> I can dream. Law schools may hope to actually offer specialized courses on originalism taught by actual originalists and not people who criticize us as a, as a straw man. Um, law schools can establish originalism clinics, right? This is not hard, folks, right? Once an issue is briefed in one court, you just copy and paste it to other courts. It's actually very repetitive work. You all know this. It's the, that's how it's done. Um, a simple order from a federal court, a standing order or otherwise, would in time trickle down to all facets of the legal profession. It's not top up, right? We don't need the Supreme Court to make this change. It could be bottom up. I'm sorry, it's not top down, it could be bottom up. And in turn, that ripple will trickle back up to the Supreme Court. Um, as the bench and bar are acculturated to originalism, it will become far more normal for the Supreme Court to base its decisions on originalism. Now, let me sort of wrap up by going back to the opening of, of my remarks today. I'm standing up here. I was born again in 1984. So my entire life, I sort of had Mies in the wings, right, just sort of doing the amazing work that he did. Um, I'm able to give this speech today because what he did, what Judge Bork did, what Justice Scalia did, what Clarence Thomas did, what President Reagan did. Uh, but for these giants, we would not be here. There would be no Mies Center for Originalism. There would not be an originalism, right? We'd still be living in the world of William Brennan, where Judge Jackson gets up and says, yep, there's a living constitution. We look to values, contemporary standards. We look to international law. Even if they will not walk the walk, so to speak, they're forcing themselves to talk the talk. We won the battle of the language. We won the battle of ideas. And now as the Supreme Court sort of ekes to the end of this term with momentous cases ahead, on abortion, on guns, on front of action, an entire slew of cases from the Warren and Burger Court may be on the chopping block. And I want you to think very carefully what comes next, right? It's not obvious. So, you know, it's like the dog who chases the car and they get doesn't know what to do with it, right? So what happens next? And all of you are very bright young law students or incoming law clerks, and you're the future. Um, and my greatest joy is to teach. That's what I love to do more than anything else. And think of how you can bring the sort of wisdom that you've gained and all the knowledge you've gained from this program uh, to the world. And let's see in 35 years, you know, what does the Constitution law look like? What Supreme Court precedents are there? What do we, is, is there nine members? Is there 150 members of the court? I don't even know. It's going to be, they're going to have to just expand a bench all the way out to Constitution Avenue, right? But my, my, my point is more broadly, we, we are really standing on shoulders of giants, uh, Bork, Scalia, Mies, and others. Um, and we should be very grateful for what they've done. Thank you so much. It's my honor, and I'm happy to take your questions.
<laughs> Take the other chair. So let's, uh, let's all sit. Uh, so I'm, I'm really just going to open this up. Uh, I hadn't even particularly planned on a Q&A, but we have plenty of time, and I want to get questions from you. I have uh, uh, one or two of my own, but I'm very happy to defer. Uh, so, so Ted, you, you raise your hand there. Let's uh, get you a microphone. Abby, right here. Hi, Josh. Great talk. Um, in terms of lower courts following Garza, only two justices joined part three of that decision. Even Alito, as a dissenter, avoided joining part three. So you have three out of the five conservative justices uh, rejecting Thomas's argument. Is, is there a way for lower courts to, to, to follow that dissent without sort of ignoring, without ignoring the fact that the Supreme Court itself didn't follow what the dissent wanted to do? Well, oh, sure. And, and I think um, what lower court judges can do, sorry, the, the glare is quite glaring with the, with, the, <laughs> with the glasses. What lower court judges can do is say very clearly, there's no Supreme Court precedent for closing these. They're not like flouting the court, but it does exert an upward uh, pressure. There's a called the trickle up effect. Right? If enough lower court judges start writing opinions, uh, concurrences, dissents from denial from Bonk, et cetera, et cetera, that does get the attention of the Supreme Court. And let's be clear, a lot of you guys are clicking for Supreme Court judges. They'll be upstairs in a couple of years, be clicking for the Supreme Court. That, that, that does travel. And I think this process might take a couple of years. It will not be overnight. Uh, but now you have Justice Barrett on the court as well. She wasn't there for Garza. Justice Kavanaugh sort of coming to his own as well. Um, Justice Jackson's an original, who knew? Um, you know, I, I'm, one can hope. So I, I think in time, this sort of pressure exerts upwards. You have to use what you have and build on the momentum. Fair question. Right here. Thanks for your talk. I, I was at Brennan's talk at Georgetown. And I was really? At, uh, How was it? Was it? Was it cool? Uh, it, yo, it was great. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my question is, uh, I think that your proposal, be the, the civil bar can handle it. What do you think about prosecutors and, and appointed uh, defense counsel? How are they going to handle it? That's I want to ask him. I mean, so uh, part of the issue, when, when General Mee said it'll be the policy of the Department of Justice to have a jurisprudence of original intention, right, uh, that's a significant move. Because if you take that mantra seriously, it constrains the power of the federal government. It might constrain the power to do certain types of prosecutions, right? Would, would, would any DOJ, either Trump or, or, or Mee or otherwise, say, we're not going to prosecute crimes based on bogus readings of the Commerce Clause anymore, right? A murder is not an interstate crime, right? I don't know that any DOJ had, John, you work in the DOJ, maybe you can answer this. Would any, would any federal U.S. attorney ever have the guts to say that? I don't think so, not no. without direction from the top. Yeah, I think that'd be a hard call, but it's a fair point. So look, uh, do what you can, right? If you're a civil attorney, if you're on the defense side, you can raise these, but I think for U.S. attorneys and state prosecutors are somewhat constrained by politics. As we know, you don't want to be soft on crime, right? You, know, you, don't, you don't want to be soft on crime, you have to enhance everything to the highest level. You can get some people, like the, in the department, the last Department of Justice, that you know issued memoranda that said you couldn't rely on, you know, guidance documents in in court records in terms of Chevron deference. But it, it takes a bit of guts, and and of course that was rescinded immediately <laughs> with the new Justice Department. I saw a hand over here. Uh, Hold on, we got a microphone for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great to see you again, Josh. Um, so you mentioned uh, lower court judges. Um, ordering orders of supplemental briefing, uh, ordering or inviting Amiki to participate. Um, so obviously, you know, my background is is in corpus linguistics. You, you've seen a couple of panels order supplemental briefing, Sixth Circuit, Ninth Circuit, and in general, the parties in those cases uh, have turned around and said. You really don't want to look at corpus linguistics. There's nothing to see here. Just go back to doing it the way that we've always done it. Uh, so do lower court judges just need to continue to bang this drum to, to get it into the heads of litigants that no, really, when we order you to do this, we really mean it? Or is there a way to sort of wrestle the parties into taking these orders seriously? 
Yeah, it's a fair question. So the, my speech tonight was based on a paper I wrote, and I actually detailed at some length Judge uh, Wolf Apar in the Sixth Circuit, Judge, Justice Thomas Lee in the Utah Supreme Court, and a few others have actually requested briefing on corpus linguistics. Um, and I agree, James, the briefing has not been superlative uh, that we've gotten there. And I think the reason why is they don't see value in doing it. Uh, so perhaps, at least at the outset, more judges have to actually write opinions doing it themselves. And once they see there's actually a judgment to be had, I mean, imagine the case, James, where the party said, don't use this, and then their client lost because of that. You have to explain that to your client. It's like, sorry, we lost the case because we didn't do what the judge asked us to do. That's never a pleasant conversation. When you talk to the counsel, if, you're, if you're, your general counsel is like, you explain what happens. Like, what do you mean you didn't take this seriously? And so, again, it's pressure from the courts can sort of nudge the lawyers in the right direction, and then they'll start hiring all of you to come become their associates and do the dirty work they don't want to do. Yeah. James, you have more work to do on the corpus linguistics, uh, getting it out there. He's getting, doing sure good work there. In the past. Are there other, uh, other questions? Yeah, Roger. Josh, I'll put to you a question that I will keep general in the interest of comedy. Um, <laughs> original, <laughs> originalists are nothing if not textualists. Yet there are constitutional texts that originalists avoid. Mm. Anna Woods is gone. Sorry, <laughs> why? And I wonder if you could square that circle for us. Are you talking about the Ninth Amendment, Roger? I'm talking about issues that came up over the past few days uh, among many of the uh, senators who were questioning Judge Jackson. Right. So when I was a law student at George Mason, my very first event was with Roger Pallon back in 2006. And it was a debate with Nelson Lund in the Ninth Amendment. So I've, <laughs> I, I, I have deep, deep respect for this question. Um, I think there are parts of the Constitution that some judges don't like talking about. The Ninth Amendment's one of them. Um, uh, Co-authors with Randy Barnett, a number of works. Randy is a leading scholar, one of the leading scholars in the Ninth Amendment in the world. And the reason why the Ninth Amendment is so uncomfortable is it says there's some rights that are not written down, they're not enumerated. And I think the Ninth Amendment gets a bad name because of abortion, right? Because people associate the Ninth Amendment with Griswold against Connecticut, the penumbras, and all this other gibberish, right? Um, Roger, maybe one of the upshots, if Roe is overturned in three months, that may sort of open up the space to revisit substantive due process as it ought to be. I mean, Judge Jackson, when they asked her at substantive due process, she said, deeply rooted in history and tradition. That's the Glucksburg test. She said, implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. Right? That's going back to a Palco against Connecticut, right? going all the way back. She didn't say evolving standards of decency. She didn't say penumbers and emanations from Griswold. So I mean, maybe there's some space post row post Dobbs, to actually give substance to process what it's due. It doesn't have this sort of taint against it. That, that, that might happen. We'll see what happens in a few months, although I, I make no predictions. I'm always wrong. I don't want to jinx anything. <laughs> Over here. Josh, one of the things I, had, I don't understand, and I'm wondering why I don't hear this more often, is that it seems like the strongest argument against the living constitutionalists is that it is anti-democratic, because it means that people are not using the democratic system to go to legislatures to change the law to what they want. But I don't hear that argument being made. I mean, to me, originalism is is completely and fully supports democracy, the democratic system we have. But I just don't hear that argument being made. Or reliance on Article 5. Yeah, I mean, look, so the Constitution is short. It fits in your pocket. You know, you could hold it right over here. Close to your heart, always. Uh, it's true. I have one in every suit. Um, <laughs> we don't forget it. The dry cleaners always get confused. With what we they would say, is this your passport? I'm like, yes, it's my passport to freedom. Anyway, um, <laughs> true. Um, uh, so Hans, I think your question is, is, is fair. Uh, who would you rather be ruled by, right? Ruled by five lawyers in the Supreme Court or ruled by a Constitution ratified, right? Now, of course, we can all be candid. When the Constitution was ratified, none of us were there, right? I wasn't there. I'm not even attorney. Mies wasn't there when it was ratified. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, I'm going to get my award rescinded before I even get it. Uh, um, but there's still legitimacy with the ratification process. And we do have Article 5, like my friend John mentioned. It can be changed. 
right? We almost had an amendment with equal rights amendment. We had a debate in the 70s and the 80s about whether we should guarantee uh, 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 equality based on gender. Now that sort of fizzled out because the Supreme Court said, whatever you guys are gonna do it by ourselves. But we came very close to a constitutional amendment. And I think it can still be done. Um, but not everything's with the federal constitution. We have states. Judge Sutton wrote a brilliant book about state constitutional law. You should all read it, right? If you don't like something, tell your state legislature to change it. If one of the court's appeals writes a bad decision interpreting state law, have the state change the law. Not everything is federal. Of course, they do a lot of stuff as well, so we have to change that too. Uh, but, but originalism is not anti-democratic. I reject that. I would much rather be governed by a constitution that's written than the predilections of five justices who are just making it up as they go along. Yeah, particularly, I suppose that if people are prepared to amend the Constitution under the guise of interpretation, no one is prepared to do the hard work of actually amending it in, in compliance with Persuading the article Persuading people. Process. Persuasion is the hard part. All right. Other questions? Hi, Josh, and thank you. Um, enjoyed your lecture. Um, I guess, first of all, if my flippant question is, to what degree do you believe Judge Jackson when she says she's an originalist? Um, you don't have to answer that one. Um, <laughs> I, I know, I know my answer. answer. <laughs> uh, but the, I, I see the greater problem in original, uh, while I agree with originalism as a concept, and, and frankly, uh, Justice Brennan suggesting it's arrogant, uh, quite the contrary, it's deeply humble. Um, uh, but the left has made a, the organized left has in, engaged in a concerted effort to make war on the language itself. I mean, we've got a, a Supreme Court nominee who doesn't know what woman, uh, woman means. Um, we've got a Supreme Court that doesn't know what marriage has meant for 6,000 years of recorded human history. Um, equity versus equality. To what degree has the, uh, I, th I think one of my professors from college would have re referred to the Melian dialogue. I think that's where the a ancient Athenians couldn't even agree on the meaning of words. And that's where we're going in this country. And I see that as a, 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 a harsh opponent of the type of originalism that many of us agree with and advocate. Do you see that as a continuing problem uh, and how do we counter it? Uh, I, I sense a Hadley Arcus, Agent Vermeule flavor of your question, just, just, just slightly. We say Vermeule three, it's like Beetlejuice, we just appear. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, look, so are there certain truths? So, I mean, let's talk about Bostock, right? This was a decision about the title, uh, title VII of the Civil Rights Act. The statute was enacted in 1964, right? A very long time ago when in most states, homosexuality was illegal, right? It was a crime. Um, yet the Supreme Court, Justice Gorsuch and Chief Justice Roberts said, of course, that the Civil Rights Act of 64 means you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, which were concepts that were unknown ent entirely in, in, that, in that era, that, that, that this could be the meaning of the text. Um, I don't know why Gorsuch did what he did. He convinced himself, and that's where we are. And I can't criticize him more than I've already done. So I'm done criticizing Gorsuch. Uh, but what I will say is that uh, there is value in textualism because for most that there is fixed meaning in the world. Some things are fixed. There's uh, certain set things in life that don't change. Um, e even, even Roger's question about substantive due process, this should be a historical inquiry, right? It's not looking what's in our hearts and minds today. And I hope that originalism in some sort could be like, kind of like the bulwark. Uh, to use another National Review icon, William F. Buckley, you know, you're sometimes standing on top of a train screaming, stop, you know, stop, stop, stop. And I feel often that originalists are doing that. You can't stop the train, but you can slow it down and tell it to sort of push the brakes a little bit. And that's how I see my job. It's some, I can't stop the collision. I can just sort of maybe postpone a little bit. And that's what I try to do. Yeah, over here, Sarah. We so appreciate what you've had to say. This is an excellent lecture and tremendously helpful. Um, you mentioned Bostock. It's a case with which I am intimately familiar. I've done a lot of writing and speaking on it. But I have a question. So we've talked about sort of the kissing cousin relationship between originalism and textualism. And in the Bostock decision specifically, can you talk a little bit about how textualism requires us 
to take a differentiation between the ordinary public meaning of terms and the literal meaning, as, for example, Kavanaugh expressed in his opinion in Bostock, and whether or not that plays any importance in our understanding of what originalism and textualism are. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. And one of my favorite analogies from the Bostock case was in Dissent by Alito, where he said, just Gorsuch on the pirate flag of textualism. That's, that's your, that's your new, this wolf comes as a wolf, pirate flag is a new line. Trust me on this one. This should be for, for, for years studied. Um, I think Gorsuch's problem was a bit of literalism. I think Kavanaugh has a fair point, that if you take the word because of sex, that literally, it, it does factor in. Uh, but Gorsuch had an even bigger problem, if you make me talk about it, I will. It's a precedent problem. If you read the Gorsuch opinion, he favorably cites all these Brennan decisions from the 70s and 80s. And he basically builds his textualist framework on this house of cards, right? Which is why this extension point is very simple. Gorsuch should have simply said, these precedents are not correct. The meaning of because of sex is not defined the way Brennan did. I think if he did that, he gets to a very different result. Um, uh, but, but, but still, we need to sort of just be careful when we're textualists. So this morning we had a workshop. I don't know if uh, you were there. But we did a workshop with the students, and I gave them a number of cases. And I said, how do you interpret the statute, number one or number two? And some of the cases, the students split right down the middle. Some they split 75-25. Some of the cases, a lot of them were with Justice Brennan, not with Justice Marshall. Right? Textualism is hard. That doesn't mean it's impossible. And I hope through study and review and, and careful reflection and working with your judges, you're able to improve on your craft. But even, even in some cases, conservatives disagree, right? I mean, in some cases, you have prominent judges who disagree, and that's fine. Uh, I just don't think Bostock could be one of those cases. I mean, just <laughs> that, that case was just sui generis. I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm at a loss. All right, let's, let's give me here. I've got one point of question I want to ask myself, but I'll, I will get a couple more. Prerogative of the moderator subsides. Yeah, that's all you right. You want to go I'll, first? I'll skip moderator prerogative for the moment. I can you hold, go right ahead. Hold no, 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 go right ahead. Let's do Please. students first. Let's hear it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Uh, so I know the focus was on lower court judges and what they can do, uh, and law clerks are really just an extension of whoever their judge is. But is there anything that we can do as law clerks now to further the originalism movement? Well, talk to your boss about it. You know, I, you know, it's like talk to your loved one about it. Right? You just, just talk to your boss about it. Get, get five minutes and say, how do you think we could do more originalism? And any, I think, credible judge would would reflect. Uh, have them watch this on YouTube. I mean, that's nice, right? It's on demand. Uh, no, <laughs> it's there. I, I know judges never check my social media. That just never happens, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, of course they do. Uh, they, they deny it, they deny it, they do, but, but talk to them about it. And I was a district court clerk as well for two years, and you're busy, you're in court every day, you have five seconds to make a decision. So for a lot of cases, you're probably not going to be able to do this, but there are some cases you have time to think and reflect on. And in some regards, district court judges are unique, there's no panel, right, there's not going to be a dissent to your opinion, you don't have to circulate an opinion, you just write it and let the circuit court deal with it. And if the circuit court deals with it, they say, wow, this is a good district court opinion, I like that judge, maybe you can sit by designation every now and then, and that's, you know, you start working your way up. Well, I'll get to you. There was a question here. I'll, I'll get to it, but I, I, would, I do want to ask my question. So you talked about, you know, sort of bad originalist opinions and trying to cabinet that in mm -hmm. some way. You've also written a lot of articles that are, are really terrific on, on the concept of judicial supremacy, and I'm curious how you navigate both of those shoals. Right, so uh, the third speech that uh, uh, General Meese gave at Tulane back in 86 was in large measure a response to Cooper against Aaron. Yeah. Now, a lot of you maybe were taught that Marbury versus Madison said that the Supreme Court is the supreme law of the land. False. False, right? He's shaking his head, no. False, it's not true. <laughs> to the extent this concept of judicial supremacy exists, it came not from Marbury, but a case called Cooper against Aaron, it was a post-Brown decision. And what effectively happened was Little Rock School District was trying to do everything in their power to not integrate their schools. They never actually flatted a court order. It was actually very carefully done. But a lower court judge said, you know what, there's too much violence. Let's extend the period till next year for integration. And the Supreme Court said, no, do it now. And what did they do? They shut down their schools. So nothing happened, right? So judicial supremacy didn't go far. But why it's significant is this one paragraph in Cooper where the court says, our decisions are the supreme law of the land. And they cited Marbury, which is absolutely false. Okay? Now, who wrote Cooper versus Aaron? It was signed by all nine judges, but Brennan wrote it. We know this from the papers. 
right? So this was Brennan. And this decision created this notion that, that the judges are supreme and that other people in you know, the executive branch and legislative branch shouldn't care about the Constitution. And one of the points that General Meese made in his remarks in 86 at Tulane is that when you have litigation, the scope of the court's judgment is to the parties between the plaintiff and the defendant. This is not a new thought. Lincoln argued this. You know, Judge Jackson had trouble with Dred Scott. Okay, let me talk about Dred Scott for a minute, okay? Lincoln in Cooper Union, very famous speech, explained that Dred Scott v. Sanford was a case about Dred Scott and Sanford. That's it. And Lincoln said, we will respect that judgment with respect to these two, but no further. And even the Lincoln administration in their own business it basically ignored Dred Scott. They issued passports to, to, to black people. Dred Scott said you couldn't do that. They gave citizenship to those who entered the Union Army, right? They, they limited slavery in the territories, which Dred Scott said you could not do, right? So the notion that you limit a decision that's wrong to its facts has really good roots with Lincoln. Uh, but people don't like that, because that leads to saying the Supreme Court's not supreme. But now, I gotta tell you, John, with liberals, they don't like this court. I think we're gonna see a resurgence of departmentalism. I'm, I'm dead serious. You're already seeing blog posts by left professors saying, let's talk about ignoring the Supreme Court. So we're basically back in Dred Scott land, right? Nothing ever changes. We're still Lincoln and Tawney. Nothing ever changes. Uh, but I, you know, I don't see a conflict, right? What is supreme, right? Go to Article 6, Supremacy Clause. What is supreme is not the Supreme Court. It's the Constitution. And if you're making a ruling based on the Constitution, you're good. You're good. You, you don't have to worry about anything. It's only when decisions are not based on the Constitution we get into the problems of departmentalism. Fascinating. So if you, if you can't pack it, ignore it. Yeah, I can't pack it, ignore it. Uh, <laughs> Burn it down. Over Burn here. the court to the ashes. <laughs> I'm burning everything down today. <laughs> the Library of Congress is on fire. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Josh. As I, I was wondering as you were speaking, um, I was thinking about, you know, for the average district court judge, they're going to probably on a given day, week, month, encounter much more in the realm of sort of everyday um, statutory interpretation mm -hmm. than constitutional interpretation. So in that light, I wondered what your thoughts were um, in the scope of this history from 1985 to 86 to the present, um, whether or not it's true that uh, we're all originalists now and everyone's willing to bite that bullet. Is it more true that we're all textualists now when it comes to statutory interpretation? And can you speak to the relative ground that textualism has gained in statutory interpretation relative to you know, the willingness of many judges at any level to apply the same rigor when it comes to major constitutional questions that attract more attention and touch on more sensitive issues? That's a fair question. So there are decisions from the Supreme Court from the 70s and the 80s that say something like this. Because the legislative history is ambiguous, we turn to the text, right? That's done. No, Scalia won that one, without question. Uh, even to this day, in the US Supreme Court, Scalia's been passed away five or six years now. They'll still say, for those who find legislative history helpful, they're still talking, even though he's, he's not here anymore. So Scalia won that battle. I think whether all judges are actually textuals or pretend, I don't know. You know, Jackson, for example. But they're going to start with the text, at least, and at least pay, pay homage to the fact that there's text. And when they cite legislative history, they're going to feel dirty. They're going to say, well, maybe we shouldn't do it, but let's do it anyway, right? You know, even Justice Breyer, he loves citing legislative history. He's gone, right? And then Jackson, well, he's uh, not yet, I'm sure. They, he, he's almost gone, right? He's, he's alive, <laughs> come on. He, he's alive, but, but, but his, his jurisprudence is over in a couple months, and his decisions will just sort of fade, right? And there's still just this aversion. So I think textualism has largely prevailed um, as a method of interpretation. Uh, now we're getting to the discussion of how to do text. And I can have that debate, right? I can say Gorsuch is wrong, but at least he's looking at the statute. He's not just saying, like Brennan said, uh, we are the agents of the people. We can look to the mores of society to interpret statutes in the best life of contemporary society. Some European nations do that. Some other countries do that. Not, not here. Not now. So if I didn't get to your question, my apologies. I just want to take a prerogative. So for, for several years now, I've been the director of the Edwin Mesa III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. It, it, it's one of the highest honors that I have had, and I, I, it's a responsibility I take every day to live up to uh, the professionalism and legacy of, uh, of, uh, of Edwin Meese. We are so delighted that you are, are here today. It's just, it's just wonderful uh, seeing you, Ed. And I am really 
thrilled, and I know that I, I speak for Ed in this, that you will have uh, the honor of being the first uh, recipient of the Edwin Meese the Third Originalism Award. You've done a wonderful job. I know everybody here has enjoyed it. We have, by the way, uh, we, ha we have a, a, a statue coming statue. to you. We commissioned it, uh, but we, we it didn't arrive in time. So I That's promise okay. you, you're going to, Fam you're going to get Famous it. last words, it's in the mail. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's in the mail, I promise. You know where I live, so it's all good. Uh, I'll say collection. Please join me in, uh, in thanking John. Thank you, John. That's good. Uh, <laughs> Awesome statue, that's great.